Hello, everybody. It's great to see some familiar faces, um, and I look forward to meeting the new ones that are in the room, but it's great to be back in the old stomping grounds for a little bit, uh, helping out on some of this stuff and, and working together with everything. So the main thing today, I guess the biggest outcome is that, that the fact that you guys are all here, um, because as Liz and I'm sure lots of conversations over the last few months, particularly after the FMD and, and uh, LSD notifications from uh, Indonesia earlier in the year have shown is that this is this is something that's going to impact on all of us. So the public, the partnerships that we have with each other, right from government through to the practitioner level, through to our producers and, and their various industry bodies is key to the whole thing running as smoothly and as effectively as we can. A uh, classic example of that, so February 2022, some of you may know, I'm trying to think who, some of the DVs in the room definitely, but I'm not sure about private practitioners, how much involvement the Riverina region had, but um, we actually had private vets and district vets receiving calls about sick piglets um, and pig issues on farms scattered about the state. Um, and throughout that process, the private vets and district vets talking to each other, talking to themselves and their colleagues, both in state in and out of state, what happened was they were, seeing the same clinical signs in pigs across the jurisdictions. EMAI was involved, they were getting submissions and starting to think, hang on, why are we seeing the same things? You know, this seems to be an increase, something different. And in actual fact, what happened was that was Japanese encephalitis that was breaking out. The traditional view on Japanese encephalitis was that, oh yeah, yeah, it's vector borne, insect related, it's gonna come in through the north of Australia, we'll pick it up plenty of time. Um, simultaneously, we diagnosed it in Queensland, South, uh, Victoria and New South Wales. No mention of it in the Northern Territory uh, or in those early case discussions. And a month later, it also popped up in South Australia. So it was a classic example of how this network actually works and how important it can be. And from there, we had 24 hours. We had the State Control Centre set up. We had one of the pig industry folks actually acting as our industry liaison officer in the response, and he was critical to provide the technical advice, to provide the conduit between us and the pig veterinarians, um, and make sure that we were actually doing the best response we could, factoring in all of the things. And then we threw health into the mix uh, from the human perspective, of course, because Japanese encephalitis has significant impacts on humans, um, probably worst, worst of all, really, from the perspective of the disease. So. Great example of how this partnership is, is ideally working um, and what we would like to see continuing. So that's why a lot of this funding and research, uh, sorry, funding and, and um, relationship building is actually happening as a result of that because it just shows how smoothly, and that, that applies back to those of you in the room that were for, from the EI the, uh, 2007 response. Um, you know, if we didn't have the private vets on the ground in that horse, outbreak, then you know, we would have struggled to probably contain it within nine months in New South Wales. So it's definitely a needed thing and there's working examples in New South Wales historically that show just how critical that is. Right. Well, I don't know about you, I've been doing this, so there's people in this room that are doing it much longer than me, but I've been doing this for 20 odd years in, in New South Wales and I don't think there's been a time when we've had the threat level from so many things affecting so many species than what we've got right now. Um, you know, the drooling cow in the first shot, traditionally from my perspective as a DV and a private vet, you know, I'd be thinking woody tongue, maybe respiratory disease, could be IBR if I was in Canada, I'd probably throw a pestivirus in there too. Um, but you know, now we have no choice but to think about, is that FMD? Uh, it's on the doorstep, so we have to factor it in. Lame sheep, lots of lame sheep. I saw them as I was coming over. Foot abscess is probably a big problem I'm imagining at the moment. A Little bit of foot rot popping up too. Um, but we've actually just diagnosed clinical cases of blue tongue disease in the north um, because of the season. They're both, they're endemic strains. So everybody panic, no, don't. Um, but yeah, similarly, we don't, trip it. there's been cases in Queensland in 2020 and the odd case scattered about, but in New South Wales, that's our first cases um, and it's just reflecting of what's happening in the NAMP herds. The, the cattle studies have shown that there's a lot of seroconversion happening to blue tongue 16 and 21, um, and we've had spillover into two farms in New South Wales that have reported, and likely others in the region that just haven't recognised. Um, and lameness and ill thrift and exercise intolerance was part of that, as well as 
scabs uh, on the nose that resolved. I don't want to dwell too much on the diseases because I think you're going to get a lot of that, but you know, sick piglets, diarrheas, could be any number of bacterial diseases in pigs, um, African swine fever, classical swine fever, PERS. <laughs> There's, there's numerous ones in the pig industry that could all be reflecting some of this stuff. So we just, it just goes to show that we have to start thinking about what else should be we be looking for. And Japanese encephalitis is one that's kind of surprised us, I guess, that if you're not necessarily looking for these things on a routine basis, um, they can catch you unawares. Not to be outdone, the small animal guys are not escaping either. Uh, and we heard from uh, Bonnie this morning from Emmerich about the E. Canis situation that they were assisting with when it broke out in the Northern Territory and, and in the South Australia and Aboriginal communities, basically. We have seen cases of E. canis coming down into our regions here, mainly from those rehoming agencies. So touch wood, New South Wales yet hasn't had any locally acquired cases to say that we've got it uh, as endemic pockets in our state yet. But we certainly, practitioners have, have certainly seen cases where their clients have have been rehoming pets from Northern Territory or Western Australia um, from those Aboriginal communities and then they found out they've got E. canis when they arrive. Rabies is always one on the radar. Uh, we get a lot of calls to the EAD hotline about bat and dog interactions or bat and cat interactions. Uh, touch wood again, we haven't got any scares about that one. Um, but yeah, you just don't know. And my lovely chicken friend over there Used to see lots of those in private practice, you know, commonly you'd think coryza, maybe ILT, some other respiratory disease, but that chicken actually looks exactly like the cases that we were seeing at the beginning of the avian influenza outbreak in Young in 2013. So avian influenza and Newcastle disease are really commonly excluded out of most chicken cases in the state. <laughs> the guys at EMAI will knock me up on that one. <laughs> wow, that's a big slide when you put it up there. So yeah, I think we covered most of those. Obviously, the barley quarter, as we, we like to call the LSD, FMD, um, <laughs> furor, if you like. But nevertheless, it, it, it certainly raised the awareness of, of the plight, if you like, of biosecurity in New South Wales, both at the community level and all the way across the board, which has been a great thing in terms of boosting preparedness and getting people's attention to start thinking about that, that we probably haven't had traction-wise before. It's out of the news now, so that interest is dropping off a little bit, but it's up to all of us to try and, you know, keep the wave rolling and see if we can keep some folks engaged and, and get them a bit further down the path. African horse sickness is another one of our diseases that we've got still on the watch list. So it broke out in Thailand in 2020. Um, they have it under control and they've got management practices in place, but it's certainly not eradicated. So. Again, it's vector-borne, so we just don't know. Thailand is not that far away, as we've seen, with random winds and various bits and pieces, so it's still on the list. Avian influenza is always on our list, as I said. Uh, we've got seven cases of seven, uh, sorry, history of seven cases in Australia in recent times, so it's one that we know we can get. But with the global situation and that heightened uh, prevalence in the Northern Hemisphere, we just you know, is that going to change the risk for Australia or is it going to stay the same in terms of the traditional migratory bird seasonal change? African swine fever. Anybody watch ProMed? ProMed just said another case in um, Riau province in Indonesia has popped up. So it's endemic in Indonesia now, it's endemic in China. That risk won't go away for us, it's going to stay the same. Um, so yeah, the, and it's still moving in slow ways through those countries. Hands up, is this number in your phone? Good job. Is your local DV phone number in your phone? <laughs> or at least the 1300 number if you're working across multiple regions. Um, pretty handy, sometimes your brain short circuits when you, can't, you just can't remember when someone puts you on the spot. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you all to add that to your phone contact list because it just makes life easy. The EMAI lab number is another good one which I don't, I've got it on there somewhere, I'm sure it'll pop up in a little while. Um, but the main thing I wanted to say is when you call the hotline, it's not just about notifying that you think you've got something. You can always call the hotline for advice and assistance um, in terms of what samples do you think you should take. This is the situation I'm dealing with. It's not what I kind of expected. Um, helping, we try and help with transmission of uh, samples to the lab 
in terms of which couriers are useful, how to fast track it if we think it's important enough or, or if there's you know, needs. Working with private practitioners certainly to, to give them the advice for their clients in terms of what to do while they're waiting or how to you know, provide them with enough information that they're not stressing out too much while they wait for results and, and know where to go next. So it's manned 24 seven. The animal biosecurity team is who you'll get eventually, but I will warn you, you do go through a call center so be a bit patient at the first point because you're talking to a, a general room of operators. They're pretty well trained and they have a triage list because they cop the phone calls from everyone. So this is the level of calls that we get on average. Um, and a lot of them, you know, nearly 50% of them are from the general public. So they cover a range of topics. Some of them are relevant to the EAD hotline, some of them are not. Um, so the call center staff do ask you, are you a veterinarian? You know, where are you calling from? What's your contact details? And once they've taken all of that and hung up the call from you, they actually are then paging us or whoever the duty officer is. If we, we have a 45 minute time response time, normally it's much, much quicker than that because most of us just answer it because it's the hotline. Um, and if for some reason that gets missed after 45 minutes, it then goes to a second and a third escalation point, which is either myself as one of the deputy CVOs uh, amongst the three of us or uh, directly to Sarah as well if we miss it. Just another pretty colorful slide that shows you the types of things that we see. Um, so we can report on all of these stats. These stats actually help us at a state level for reporting to inform the DPI executives and the other members and the minister so that she understands you know, what's happening at that state level and how important it is for us to have the ability to man this, this hotline. Um, but similarly, it then goes up to the Australian status, stats and reported internationally um, about the ability of Australia to capture the reporting from the public. Role of the private vets, I don't think I'm telling you anything new there, but uh, the main thing, I guess, you know, we have that role. Did you guys have that role? Um, and they're wide and varied, and most of the time it's, you know, probably not front of mind necessarily in, in some of the categories. But and the biggest one we're trying to, I guess, enhance at the moment is thinking about what role you could have in emergency response um, and how we can all facilitate that and make it easier for you um, so that if you do get called into a response, you actually have enough background um, yeah, to feel confident in whatever role you're being asked to do. As a comparison, this is what the, the district vets and the government vets kind of do. So overlap there obviously with the DVs doing field investigations. They're obviously focusing at the regional level so and on notifiable diseases and specific state or national programs like foot rot, anthrax, uh, E. canis, Japanese encephalitis. You know, they have a slightly different view of that compared to the individual animal treatment, which is a slight variation, but obviously all of you together make up the surveillance for New South Wales. Certification, some uh, DVs have to do that property of origin certification for animals going through export particularly. Um, and again, that's at that regional level. So it's not necessarily the animals on farm A that are going for a particular consignment. It's more about where's that farm, farm sitting in the region and what's been happening in terms of the whole uh, property certification. Obviously they're authorised officers under the Biosecurity Act so they have the ability to do that compliance monitoring when needed um, like NLIS in a sale yard and implementing state and national policies so uh, lots of those to administer as DVs you can <laughs> talk to them about the woes of trying to keep on top of all of those. The Riverina region pretty much covers them all. Uh, it's a very busy region. We've got diversity of livestock species here. Um, so for the most part, uh, bar cattle tick, um, there's not very many that the, the DVs in this region and then in fact the private vets could get exposed to in terms of national and state policy in, in this Riverina space. And, uh, and then we've got the lab here today that you'll be hearing from later. So obviously they're integral to all of this because they help uh, translate some of that field medicine and sampling information into the bigger picture from a clinical point of view and point us in the right direction if we're just going, here's a bunch of stuff, help us figure out what's, what's what when you send it all in. So the key thing today, again, this has been covered, but so then just on the national guidelines, I'm not sure if you've seen 
on the DAF, the Commonwealth website, the, the national guidelines for engagement of vets in private, uh, in an EAD. Um, I know some of you will have, because I've seen comments that you've put in, which was great. Um, this was set up in 2011 as a result of the equine influenza outbreak and some of the issues that came up in terms of getting private vets engaged into the response. Um, so the framework is set up that in, it steps through the rates of pay, which are now updated and relevant for 2023. So they were really out of date uh, with the version that's on the website. So don't take any notice of that because they haven't been reviewed since 2013. Um, or certainly not in the published version anyway. So that's all been updated and that will be replaced on the website soon to be more relevant. That was done in conjunction with the AVA at a national level, which was great. Um, and then it outlines the ability whether you can be contracted as a veterinarian, traditionally where you're doing surveillance tasks in a response um, or potentially assisting with vaccine rollout if it's, if it's used, um, but also then the potential for temporary employment uh, if you're working within a control centre, most commonly, um, where you're actually part of the, the machinery of the response as opposed to out in the field. So those details are all in that. The website version will still give you the basic concepts, but it has been updated. So if you don't want to read it yet, just hang on and the new one will come up soon. Lots of training, which you'll hear about over the next few hours, I'm sure, but there's flyers up the back as well. This is the range of stuff that we've got on the FMD preparedness front. So as Liz pointed out, there was, there was lots of government activity on that front and lots of ministerial support to get funding out to fast track these. The DPI took the view of it might be banded as FMD, uh, but the processes that we've put in place and the projects we've chosen are deliberately designed to be transferable to other diseases. Um, so whatever we do with destruction, disposal, decontamination and how to better do it uh, with minimal impact on the livestock uh, and the animals, but also on the humans that are involved, that's all transferable because it's more of a problem about mass destruction and mass disposal and not contaminating environment and breaking people at the same time. Uh, so we've got work in composting in that space to make it more friendly environmentally uh, faster and the ways that that can be done to minimize handling and, and more efficient as well as pyrolysis, which is something new. Um, pyrolysis is, think of burning, but it actually isn't burning because you're heating them to temperatures of well over 500 degrees Celsius. They actually change the carbon principles and you end up with an inert carbon product, which potentially could be used for fertilizer. Uh, works on everything but prions at this stage until we can get it hotter. Digital movement permits, so I'm not sure if any of you have been involved in responses, but obviously we can't just stop everything while we figure out what's going on, because it could be months. So there's always permits to allow specific movements to occur. And we've been working for a while to try and get one that would at least facilitate the application for producers um, and facilitate easier management and streamlining in the back end. So that's coming through as a digital process. Um, and it's looking not too bad. It'll be first version, of course, so there's always going to be improvements, but it's a step above a paper-based system where people have to phone and, you know, tra file the paper trail. So it's just modernizing the systems. Um, response training, there's lots of that. As we mentioned, the EAD kits um, and increased professional development, there's lots in that space as well. And um, vaccination is probably a spot where we've, we've only used it with equine influenza in terms of response, mass rollout. Um, certainly in my experience in 2007 in the response, there were some efficiencies that could have been made, let's put it that way, um, let alone thinking about it in terms of rolling it out in an FMD or a lumpy, a lumpy skin disease capacity. So a lot of work we're aiming to do, we're not finished yet, it will continue certainly in the next 12 months to figure out how to most efficiently plan for a vaccination rollout, which groups of livestock would we be doing? Um, you know, how is it actually gonna work if you've got limited supplies versus all the supply you could get? Um, and making sure that we've got cold chain sorted out so that we learn from COVID. And EPI, so risk assessments is a primary one where we're sort of scenario based thinking about what are the common things we think we're gonna get asked, particularly around movements. Um, and can we do a risk assessment to a point where we could pick it up and just add the detail um, and have a lot of the information already there to make faster decision making and, and make sure that it's scientifically sound. That's the whole range of training options. So I'll give you a minute to peruse, but as uh, Dion said, AIMS training, 
the key to AIMS training, we've got the feedback from veterinarians that were helping in the floods earlier this year and last year that they came into the response. It didn't feel like it was a structure from their perspective. Um, and because they didn't understand that it was based on AIMS in the background, which every emergency response agency uses. So it doesn't matter if you're SES, RFS, police. AIMS is the process that they base their response structures on. So there is a very clear structure in the back end. Um, and if you break outside of the AIMS process in a response, it causes a lot of flow on effects in the back room. Um, and so it's really critical. Once the vets understood there was a process, they actually felt a lot more comfortable. So that took us in New South Wales, after talking to Vets Beyond Borders and Vets for Compassion and the ABA, to say, well, let's actually subsidize, well, in this case, let you train for free, um, courtesy of the government, uh, the AIMS training, so that you can get that understanding and that will allow you to work in any state or territory uh, because it's the same principle across all of Australia. Specifically though, M train will give you that DPI flavor um, and the types of roles that you might be involved in if you're working a response in DPI in New South Wales. And then there's all kinds of other things, the vet lab testing, Hopefully you're all taking part in that. If you've got cases that suit, just talk to your DV or um, reach out to that, but it's available till the 30th of June. Sadly, yeah, this money was connected to a deadline of 30th of June as government money often is. Um, so that's why the push is on to try and get as much of this taken advantage of as we can before we have to put in another bid for more to continue. <laughs> That's the main message. We're all in the same collective, I guess, um, and we all love talking to each other. I don't know about you guys, but I love hearing from everybody. Um, I've talked to many of you in the room on the hotline um, <laughs> to sort out problems at the time. And yeah, I, I can only say it's a collegiate. It works really well when we have that communication. And as most of us know in responses or anything, um, the, the crux of it is the relationships that you've got prior to the stressful event and the communication that you maintain throughout those is the key to actually making it all work and keeping people comfortable. Because if you don't give enough information and communication, then it starts to get made up and then you get the myths starting to happen and it all starts to go pear-shaped pretty quickly. That's it for me. Hopefully I was on time. Hold on. <laughs>